Recently, I made a video on why The Order of the Phoenix was my favorite film in the franchise, and after arguing my case, a lot of people agreed. But I got a lot of comments saying that their favorite was the third film in the series, The Prisoner of Azkaban. So I decided to make a video essay on this film too. It's not my favorite, but it's by far the best film in the franchise from a technical standpoint. I actually studied this very movie during my time as a film student, and in this video, I'm going to break this film down, and I'm going to explain why I have so much respect for this film from a cinematic point of view. Before we start, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on to make sure you never miss a Movie Flame video. Now let's get started. I do have many problems with this film, like the fact that they made Dumbledore, the smartest and most powerful wizard in the world, dumb and oblivious. <gasps> or having Harry use magic outside of school in the very first scene. Lumos Maxima. Or the fact that they changed Tom from the Leaky Cauldron to make him pointless comic relief. <laughs> and some other comic relief examples that ruin the suspense of a scene, like Trelawney choking after telling the prophecy. And servant and master shall be reunited once more. And most of all, the fact that they completely skipped over the Marauder's backstory. And those are just a few reasons why it's not my favorite. There are many more. But this video isn't about why I dislike the film. It's about breaking down the cinematic aspect of it. As I said, I have more respect for this film than most of the others, mainly because I see that it's not just a big blockbuster film. This is a cinematic masterpiece. The man responsible for this is the director, Alfonso Cuaron. This was the only film in the franchise that he directed, and his style of filmmaking really shines. There's so many deeper meanings, incredible camera work, and just masterful direction throughout the entire film. When setting out to make this movie, Alfonso wanted to make this his own and put his stamp on it, which I think he did very successfully. This film stands out more so in style than any of the other ones. That being said, Alfonso realized that he had a big job as this was part of a saga and he had to keep it grounded with the first two films directed by Chris Columbus, and again, I think he did that very well too. J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series, was very keen on the idea of having Alfonso direct, but this decision turned many people's heads as he just came off a very sexy, racy, and more adult film. So the idea that he was going to do a kids film was questionable to some people, but ultimately he was the right choice. One thing he did really well was make this movie be able to stand on its own, something that the other films could not do. If you watch the other movies without seeing the rest in the series, you'll be lost. But here, part of his filmmaking style was to make it be able to stand on its own, and that's one of the reasons why it stands out so much in the series. And going off Alfonso's style and how it stands out, one of the biggest examples of this is the coloring of the movie. The two movies before this were very saturated with bright colors, but the third film is much darker, even the title going from gold to silver, and that darkness perfectly reflects reflects the narrative, which has many more dark moments compared to Chris Columbus's films. While the other films were more silly and lighthearted, this movie deals with dark creatures that represent depression and other scary creatures like werewolves, there's execution, talk of murder, and it dives into darker and deeper places for the characters. I hope he finds me. Because when he does, I'm going to be ready. When he does, I'm going to kill him. The tone and color palette shifted a great deal, and the flat lighting compared to the first two films gave way to a somber and dangerous feel, making it seem almost like a horror movie. And it's quite accurate when the Washington Post critic called it, everything the first two films were not. This movie has many deeper meanings throughout, shown through cinematic techniques, and my favorite example of this is Harry and Lupin's relationship. Let's look at two scenes that the characters have together, the first one being the scene on the bridge. That suggests that what you fear the most is fear itself. This is very wise. The scene starts with Lupin educating Harry. As he does this, there's somewhat of a distance between the two. Notice how Harry is facing out while Lupin is facing in toward Harry. Then Harry brings up his mother, and Lupin faces out just like Harry, the two now on the same level, no longer student and teacher, but two people who have a shared feeling of loss when thinking about Lily. Then when Lupin begins talking about himself, he turns his back on Harry, unable to look him in the face, as he hints at his disease that he's so ashamed of. He had a way of seeing the beauty in others, even and perhaps most especially when that person could not see it in themselves. The camera then pans in and has a beautiful shot that separates the two by a wooden bar. And as the scene ends, the two bond over James and Lily, and Lupin comes back over. And once again, they're no longer student and teacher, but they're now friends. They've become closer during this conversation, and they stand next to each other, both facing out the same way as equals. Now if we look at another scene between these two, this time the scene where Lupin teaches Harry the Patronus charm. This time Harry is the one who gets vulnerable. As he talks to Lupin, they're both facing each other, but as soon as he starts talking about a very deep 
memory. He turns away from Lupin, unable to look at him, just as Lupin did to Harry on the bridge when he got deep. Once again, as the camera moves in, they're split apart by an object in the scene, this time the candle in the background, and the person talking and getting vulnerable is on the left, while the person listening is on the right. The scene ends very similarly to how the scene on the bridge ended as well. While the two are pretty far apart for the entirety of the scene, at the end, the two are next to each other and closer than they had been throughout. This shows that they grew closer during the events that took place, and just like the bridge scene, both are facing the same way looking at the camera. And on top of that, in both scenes, the thing that made them bond was James and Lily. It's almost as if these two scenes rhyme, it's like poetry. So what made these scenes work so well? Well, the biggest thing is the technique that Alfonso chose to use for these scenes, and really throughout the whole film, which is the long take, meaning that the scene is filmed in one shot with no cuts. Let's take a look at perhaps the best long take in the film, which was the scene in the Leaky Cauldron. This is probably the most talked about sequence in the film, and the most revered, and I'm going to explain why. It starts with a large view of the place, and we see many things going on, mostly magic stuff floating in the background, which sets the mood and tone for the Wizarding World, this being the first real scene in the Wizarding World so far in the film. The camera then moves away from the room and moves into the characters to have the audience focus on the conversation rather than the environment. It then gets really interesting when Mr. Weasley comes in. He has to have a word with Harry, and as they move, a wanted poster of black comes into view, essentially foreshadowing what the conversation will be about. The camera moves past the poster, making the shot nothing but the wanted poster for a split second, and the really cool part about this is that from here on out, the poster of black will stay in the shot until it moves to the last part of the scene. As Mr. Weasley tells Harry that he's in danger, You are in danger. Grave. They move closer to the poster of Black. Then Harry mentions Sirius Black. Has this anything to do with Sirius Black, sir? And looks at the wanted sign. And the poster that has been there throughout is finally mentioned. When Black becomes the key point of the conversation, the poster is framed in the middle of the shot in between the two characters in the scene. Then as the scene ends, we move away from the poster and it's just the two of them in a much darker image lighting-wise, which matches the dark turn that the conversation takes as Harry realizes that Black is trying to kill him. And kill me. It zooms in on just Harry, who just discovered this crazy and disturbing news. We see his reaction to it, and it ends this minute and 49 second long take. Looking at the beginning to the end of the scene, we went from a crowded and large pub to the smallest corner with just Harry. It artistically shrinks the scene more and more as it goes. This moment marks a crucial change in the narrative tone. The film started with two comedic scenes, Harry blowing up his Aunt Marge, and the comical night bus scene. Now for the first time in the movie, the theme of grave danger is introduced, and it's something that continues throughout the rest of the movie. This long shot was Karan's way of creatively providing information about the story through choreography and movement, which is much more engaging and interesting to watch than a simple expositional table scene. And there are many other examples of long takes throughout the film, like when Dumbledore and Snape talk, and as soon as they start talking about Harry, it focuses on him. All of these long shots add so much to the scene, and they allow Alfonso to move the camera in ways that you wouldn't be able to do had you not choreographed the scene in one shot the way Alfonso insisted on doing. Another thing that Alfonso did that added so much to not just this film, but to the rest of the films in the franchise, was to focus on the geography of Hogwarts. He insisted on linking the different sets to show the relation between these places, as well as intertwining the grounds all together, and it really makes you feel like Hogwarts is alive. Not only that, but it also makes the audience know where the characters are going, and it adds wonder and suspense because you know where they're headed. It makes the audience think, Oh, that's the way to Hagrid's hut. We saw that earlier. I wonder what they're going to do there. Or, that's the way to the Whomping Willow. They're headed into danger, turn back while you can. It builds so much suspense, and it really makes the audience connect with not just the characters, but the actual grounds. We come to know it and love it, just like we did with the characters. And going on that, one artistic decision that Alfonso made was to not just focus on the characters, but to also focus on the things in the magical world, and to make them a living entity. He made the characters and the environment have the same weight, and this was an interesting decision because it led to not many close-ups, as it was more powerful to blend the characters with the environment in amazing establishing shots. One of the best examples of this is the clock tower. We see Harry with this clock tower many times throughout the movie, and every time we do, Alfonso perfectly made the two mesh, and you really do focus on the clock like it's living, just as much as you do on Harry. The clock is also used for great foreshadowing. Time plays such an important part in this narrative, with the time turner and the climax focusing on Harry and Hermione going back in time to save Buckbeak and Sirius. By constantly showing the clock, it gives you the idea that time is important, but it does it in such a subtle way that you don't even notice. But deep down, it's intriguing because your brain does notice it. 
And again focusing on the clock, there are two scenes where Harry is by himself with the clock, and both times he's watching everybody go to Hogsmeade when he's not able to. The first time we see this, he's on the ground underneath the clock. He's vulnerable, helpless, small, and most of all, defeated. He accepts that he can't go. But in the next scene that parallels this, he's again standing with the clock as he watches them leave, but this time he's up higher. He feels more powerful looking down, and this time he's not helpless and doesn't give up. He decides that he's not just going to sit there and accept it this time, but rather, he's going to sneak into Hogsmeade with his invisibility cloak. While we're on the topic of foreshadowing, another great example of this is the Whomping Willow. Alfonso utilized this tree so well, not just by showing time pass based on seeing the tree in the different seasons, but we constantly go back to this tree, and it's foreshadowing for how important it will be later on in the narrative, as many of the most exciting and important events take place here. They also show us how dangerous the tree is in a very subtle way by showing us birds getting killed by it multiple times. It puts in our head that this tree is powerful and deadly, and now that we know that, it makes it even more suspenseful when the trio finally does encounter the tree. Harry, you do realize what tree this is? That's not good. And we saw this tree in the last film, but as I said, Alfonso wanted this film to stand on its own, so by showing the birds getting killed, it tells us that it's dangerous even if we didn't see the danger it imposed in the last film. The camera work throughout this film is beyond amazing. It's forever moving, especially when giving information. It zooms in on the character who gives that information, and then zooms in on the character who's getting the information. It's a great technique, and it really adds a lot of gravity to each scene. One of the best examples of this are two scenes that end zooming in on Harry, and again, these two scenes are almost like poetry. Both examples are long shot sequences, the one I discussed earlier in the Leaky Cauldron, and another long shot scene in the Great Hall. At the end of each, Harry finds out something about Sirius Black, whether it be that he's after him, or that he was sighted near him, and both scenes start with a bunch of people at a table, and by the end, it shrinks the shot down to just Harry's reaction to this news. Alfonso also has some amazing shots that focus on glass as the camera moves through a window or a mirror, and they are without a doubt some of the coolest and most artsy shots in the entire Harry Potter film franchise. Some other really interesting shot choices are those that are from the point of view of an object or a character, whether it be from the point of view of the Jack in the Box moving back and forth on Harry, or the camera flowing with the movement of the Dementor, or from the point of view of the Whomping Willow Branch, and even seeing the scene from Harry's point of view with no glasses or right before he's about to pass out, making it very blurred. And speaking of point of view shots, there are many examples of this throughout the film, and Alfonso used it to great extents to make us feel like we are or are with Harry. The most notable scene is the one in the three broomsticks when he's under the invisibility cloak. We see from his eyes, and we can even hear his breathing. <laughs> It gives us much more suspense because we feel like if Harry gets caught, we get caught too, as we are Harry. And every time I watch that scene, my heart beats super fast, even though I've seen it so many times. And even small point of view shots are well done, like when Harry's looking up at Stan Shunpike or looking up at the Dementor. Throughout the film, the camera moves with Harry and is almost always at his eye level. If he stands, the camera stands too. If he sits down, so does the camera. By having these shots follow or having us see through Harry's eyes, it makes us feel as though we are with Harry on his adventure. The film also did a great job isolating Harry, especially from Ron and Hermione. We constantly see Harry on the other side of the two, whether it be the two of them going to Hogsmeade when he couldn't go, or when he leaves them in Hogsmeade, one minute he's there, and the next he's gone. And even just small things in very well done shots, like Harry being on the opposite side of them in the shot with Hagrid. It shows distance, and it isolates Harry throughout. The only thing I wish the film did more was explore what's going on inside of Harry, rather than what's going on outside of him, and this is something I praised in the Order of the Phoenix, as it was able to go deep down into Harry's character and explore his inner demons, whereas here, it's all physical, it's not mental. We see him be isolated, but it doesn't explore why he's isolated or why he's away from Harry and Hermione. It just shows it. But that being said, The Prisoner of Azkaban did this very well, and in my opinion, did the second best job when it came to Harry's character. Something that I really liked was the fact that they showed water turn to ice when Dementors came, with the water bottle on the train, the rain on Harry's broom, and the ice forming on the lake. This was something that wasn't in the books, because in the books, they could just come out and say that Harry felt cold when Dementors were coming. But in the film, you can't say that, you have to show it. And having the water turn to ice was the perfect way of representing this. It's chilling, it's unnatural to happen so fast, and it really sets the mood for what dangers are about to come. 
One of the most original and impressive decisions that Alfonso made on this film was to make the Shrieking Shack set move and tilt so they could get some really cool and unique looking shots. To be honest, you probably would not notice this if I didn't tell you, but even without knowing, it adds so much to each shot, and deep down in your brain, you can tell that there's a difference and you think it looks really cool, but at the same time, you never really know why you liked it so much. It's so subtle, but it adds so much to each shot. This also makes the oh so common over the shoulder dialogue scene much more intriguing, and it adds movement to a very boring filmmaking technique. I feel I can't talk about this film without discussing the infamous time travel long shot. I don't have too much to say, but it was really well put together and gave you a sense of time travel in a very unique and creative way. Transitions are another big thing that I absolutely love in this film. The use of sound is utilized very well for some transitions, like when they cut from Harry to the Hogwarts Express. This is the scene that I broke down earlier in the Leaky Cauldron, and at the end, it starts to have the sound of the train before it cuts to actually showing the train. And it makes the very last shot of that one scene when Harry just found out this disturbing information. And by having that train sound effect build up, really adds suspense and makes you feel uncomfortable, which is exactly how Harry's feeling. I also love how Alfonso used the circle in and out transition when it came to Harry passing out or waking up. It was just a nice touch, and it was nice to see some consistency throughout the film when it came to that aspect. Another big reason why I love the transitions of this film is because of the way some scenes end. They have fabulous ending shots that really show the weight of the scene. And a lot of the time, it's after a very important or tear-jerking conversation. We see the aftermath of that conversation, and it makes the audience hang on to it and allows you to reflect on what you just heard. Overall, this film is not my favorite in the series. I have a lot of problems with it story-wise, and I hate some of the decisions that they made. But overall, I respect it more than any of the other films in the franchise, primarily from a technical standpoint. Alfonso put his stamp on this film, and he did an outstanding job, bringing some artistic decisions to the series, changing the tone of the series, and adding many things that the later films would continue to use throughout, specifically the additions to Hogwarts and the way he made the geography of the castle come to life. I hope I shed some light on what made this film so good, and hopefully you guys learned a few things from me ranting and breaking the film down. I plan to make a video essay on every Harry Potter film. So far, I've done Order of the Phoenix and obviously Prisoner of Azkaban. And next is Gobble to Fire, so look out for that. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and see more of this little dude. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook for Movie Flame updates. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured in the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you press that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great videos on the way.